with Hallmark card when you carry enough to send the very best. Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark cards bring you McDonald Carey in Wave High the Banner on the Hallmark Playhouse. Each week, Hallmark brings you Hollywood's greatest stars in outstanding stories and presents as your host one of the most distinguished actors of the American theater, Mr. Lionel Barrymore. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Lionel Barrymore. You know, American history is a fascinating subject, not only because of the many stirring events which have gone into the making of our nation, but because of the men behind those events, the men who made them happen and who took part in them. Davy Crockett was one of those men, a romantic figure in an adventurous age and the hero of D. Brown's fine book called Wave High the Banner. For our dramatization of that book and the star in the role of the dashing Davy Crockett, Hallmark Playhouse has invited one of Hollywood's favorite actors, McDonald Carey. And now, here's Frank Goss from the makers of Hallmark Car. When you're looking for a way to say something to someone you care for, look for a Hallmark card, and you'll find the card you want to send. Because Hallmark cards are designed to say what you want to say, just the way you want to say it, with the good taste you demand of anything that bears your signature. That's why Hallmark on the back of a greeting card has come to mean you cared enough to send the very best. Lionel Barrymore appears by arrangement with Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, producers of Above and Beyond, starring Robert Taylor and Eleanor Parker with James Whitmore. And now, here's the first act of Wave High the Banner, starring MacDonald Carey. Tennessean stands motionless in the church doorway and stares up at the sky. There's no moon tonight, and each star flames out with a clear, cold brilliance. Down by the river, the whippoorwill calls. The man in the doorway listens intently, then shrugs his shoulders and turns back into the church. Here and there, Among the shadows, he can make out the fitful flare of candles. Each candle rests upon a barrel head, and at each barrel head, a man sits writing. Colonel David Crockett pulls a sheaf of paper from his pocket. He, too, has a letter to write. My dear son, I've been thinking a lot about you tonight and of some of the things I've wanted so long to tell you. Somehow, there never seemed to be time for it. But now, now there is time. Not very much, but still enough. I remember when you were little, you and the other children used to ask me what your mother was like. Well, John, I can answer that now. Look at your sister, Polly. She's just about the age my Polly was the night we first met. The same laughing blue eyes, the same wild brown hair swirling about her face, the same slender waist and dancing feet. Ah, I wish you could have seen my Polly dance. Hello. You're Davy Crockett, aren't you? Uh Uh-huh. How'd you know? I asked the fiddler, who was the boy in the coonskin cap? Oh. And you're Polly Finley. Uh Uh-huh. But how'd you know? 
I asked the fiddler who was the prettiest girl here. <laughs> Come on, let's dance. A village dance in the mountains of Tennessee. That was where we met. And then one day, a little later, Polly and I went for a walk in the woods. We sat down by the creek, and Polly dangled her feet in the water. Davy, I haven't heard you laugh all afternoon. What you thinking about? Oh, just things. Something about us? Uh-huh. Oh, I'm glad. Polly, I don't think your family likes me. It doesn't matter. Your pa knows that all I own is the clothes I'm wearing and an old rifle. That doesn't matter. Your ma said something about me being just a hired man working one place and then another. That still doesn't matter. There's... Something else, too, Polly. I can't read or write. Oh, well, that... That does matter. I never cared much about myself. But now, all of a sudden, it's awful important because... Because I'm in love with you. Oh, oh Davy, that's all that matters. Polly. You should have known, Davy. Polly, this changes everything. I'll learn to read and write and... I'll go hunting and bring back enough fur pelts to pay for a wedding. It won't be long, Polly. As soon as I get the fur. Then it might be right tomorrow, Davy. You see, that's the one good thing even Pa says about you. That you're the best shot in the whole of Tennessee. No, it wasn't long. Soon after, Polly and I said goodbye to the village and headed south. I wanted the frontier life, and we found it in Lincoln County. I built a cabin, and our first son was born. You, John. By the time I'd cleared the timbers, sowed the first seed, and harvested the first crop, he had a brother. And the next year, a sister, Polly. It was a year that meant much to me and to the nation. It was a hard riding mountaineer who brought us the first news of danger in that year of 1812. I tell you, it ain't just talk. The British are running guns into every engine village south of here. The Creeks will be sending raiding parties up this way any day now. Oh, Davy, the children. Now, now, Polly. Every engine we've met around here has been all right. They all know me, and I hope, trust me. You hope? That ain't good enough, friend. The only way we're going to save our skins is to attack the engines first. That's what Andy Jackson says. Andrew Jackson? Sure, he's leading the militia. And wherever old Andy leads, Abram Henry is going to be right behind. <laughs> well, if Jackson needs men, if he can stop the engines before they get started... Polly... It's all right, Davy. Don't worry about us. The children and I will be here waiting for you and praying for you. Our hopes for a quick campaign came to nothing. The engines attacked Fort Mims and murdered over 500 settlers. It was many weary months before we avenged that day. Our enlistments in Jackson's army were long expired, but still we kept marching and fighting and marching again. And then I got word that Polly was sick. When I got home, I knew it was too late. <coughs> I, I said I'd wait for you, Davy. And I have. I have. Oh, Polly. Polly, it's all my fault. Maybe if I'd stayed here with no, you. No, no, Davy. You had to go. Don't ever regret being you, Davy. You could never turn away from a fight, and you never will. You'll do what you must because you must. And someday, someday you'll be great. It'll come, Davy. It'll come. I buried her there in the shadow of the pines. I never felt so helpless in all my life. <laughs> An engine fighter with three babies. It was time to forget the wilderness, to live near people, to have neighbors who could watch after my children with children of their own. That's why we moved west to Shoal Creek. Remember, John, the grist mill I built on its banks? Remember how you and Willie and Polly used to play hide-and-seek back in the green loft? It made us a good living. And pretty soon, people began to call me Squire Crockett. Then one day, I went to the village inn and found they had another name. Howdy, Colonel. How's everything at the mill? Just fine, Hank. Say, what'd you just call me? <laughs> That's right. 
I guess you're the last one to hear about it. Seems like you're running for colonel of the state militia. Huh? Who started all this? A fella sitting over there with a fiddle in his lap. Hi, Davy. Abram Henry. <laughs> oh, you old sinner. When place did you come from? No place in particular. I'm going no place in particular. <laughs> Andy Jackson don't need engine fighters no more, so this is my new line of business. The fiddle? But don't laugh at it, Davy. It'll be mighty handy to have a fiddle around when you start politicking and making speeches. Ah, so that's why you're talking me up to be colonel. You need a job. It's more than that, Davy. <laughs> I was with you in the militia long enough to know a natural-born leader. I say the man who's the best shot in Tennessee, the best bear hunter, and the grittiest fighter ought to make the best colonel. You make speeches to the folks, Davy. I'll fiddle for them, and we'll show them. And we did show him. In a few weeks, I was colonel in charge of the district regiment. And then, almost before I was settled down to my new command, some of the voters had a new idea. The boys like the way you campaigned, colonel. They're saying you're just the kind of man we need in the state legislature. Oh, now, hold on, Hank. I can handle the militia, but I talk too plain to be a politician. That's just why we want you, colonel. the next election, the voters agreed with Hank. Then one day, after I'd been speaking in the legislature, Sam Houston came up to me. He was just back from Washington. Colonel Crockett, I want you to know that I'm giving up my seat in Congress and coming home here to run for governor. And you'll be elected, sir. Tennessee needs a big man for a big office. Those are the very words I was going to say to you, Colonel. Tennessee needs you in Congress in my place. Well, I appreciate your confidence, sir. But I expect there'll be a mighty lot of others fighting for it, too. Granted. But if I know you, you're not the man to turn away from a fight. You know, somebody else told me that once. She said, don't ever regret being you, Davy. You could never turn away from a fight, and you never will. You'll do what you must because you must. And someday... Someday... Mr. Houston, I reckon maybe that someday is here. Turn to the second act of Wave High the Banner, starring MacDonald Carey. Do you recall this saying by a famous country philosopher? It takes two great people to make a great friendship. When you think about it, those words ring as true as any you've ever heard. Yes, to be a good friend, you must have a capacity for sympathy and understanding and constant thoughtfulness. And that's why I want to suggest that you get a brand new Hallmark date book soon. You see, the 1953 Hallmark date book is a page-by-page -page monthly calendar with space for notes beneath each day of the new year. In it, you can jot down the birthdays and wedding anniversaries of your friends and uh, even the arrival dates of their new babies. Then all you need to do is refer to your Hallmark date book to find the exact time a special card is in order. You'll find the Hallmark date book as pretty and compact, just the right size to slip into your pocketbook. Best of all, it's a gift to you from the fine store where you buy your Hallmark cards. Why not ask for yours tomorrow? Now, back to Lionel Barrymore in the second act of Wave High the Banner, starring McDonald Carey. In the sky above the tiny church, the stars are beginning to fade and go out. The night's all but spent, and inside the church, Colonel David Crockett hurries to finish the letter to his son, a letter which he writes by the light of a candle fastened to a barrel head. We never did have much.
much time, did we, John? To sit down and just talk about life? After I was elected to Congress, there was less time than ever. For a while, it looked like everybody I knew was being elected to office. Andy Jackson was president, and Sam Houston, governor of Tennessee. After I'd served my third term in Congress, I came back home and found that a lot had happened while I was in Washington. Sam Houston had gone out to Texas, and about the only friend I had left in town was Abram Henry. That was what decided me. Oh, not you too, Davy. You ain't leaving us. Well, I hear Texas is a fine country, Abram. Uh-huh, for us to keep out of. The way I look at it is this. Sam Houston's out in Texas, and Sam's a man that believes in the future and builds for it. All he needs is men to help him. You mean men handy with a rifle? Well, Abram, who have you been saying is the best shot in Tennessee? I don't know. Nothing could ever scare you out, David Crockett. All right. When do we get going? You know when that was, John. The very next day. We rode west of the Mississippi and took the steamboat down the river. Every night, Abram would tune his fiddle and sanade the passengers. One of them was a gambler. He called himself Thimble Ray. Can't see why Texas is so important, Colonel. What's it matter who runs the country? What's the difference? All the difference between living in fear under unjust laws or in freedom, as Americans ought to live. Well, I'm just a river gambler, Colonel. Nothing matters much to me. Justice, injustice, what's the difference? If I felt that way, sir, there wouldn't be any point in living. Maybe there isn't. Die today, die tomorrow. What's the difference? Hey, Davy. Hey, uh, yes, Abram. I was just talking to a couple of boys. As soon as they heard you was Colonel Crockett, they wanted to know if they could join up with us. What'd he say? You tell him we'll be glad to have him. The more men for Sam Houston, the better. By the time the boat reached Louisiana, there was 12 of us. And when we walked down the gangplank, there was a 13th. 13's my unlucky number, Colonel. But what's the difference? We crossed into Texas territory and headed west to San Antonio. There I reported to Colonel Travis, the commander of the garrison. We're mighty glad to have you and your men, Colonel Crockett. But if you're looking for Sam Houston, he's over on the Brazos, helping set up a provisional government. Then the Mexican army's been cleaned out of Texas? Yeah, we did it right here in San Antonio. We took over the garrison, pushed them south to Rio Grande. How soon do you think they'll try coming back? The Mexican army? <laughs> Never. Colonel, you don't mind. Think my boys and I'll hang around for a spell? Following night, Colonel Travis called me to the garrison. Colonel Crockett, I'd like you to meet Senora Canaleria. How do you do, ma'am? Then you. Would uh, you mind repeating to Colonel Crockett what you just told me, Senor? Si, Comandante. My cousin Juan, he arrived in San Antonio tonight. Juan come from the Rio Grande. He watched General Santa Ana cross the river. When? Last week. Colonel Travis, what's the strength of your garrison? About 140. Not nearly enough. Well, we don't know that he's planning an attack on San Antonio. I reckon all we can do is wait. The next day was Sunday. And that night, all the Mexicans in town held a big fandango. The music and dancing reassured us. Perhaps everything was all right. Then, Monday, the Mexicans started to pile all their belongings into carts and head for the open country. Things were not all right. I rounded up the 12 men who'd crossed Texas with me. Abram, I want you up in the tower of that church across the plaza. If you see any enemy troops, start ringing the church bell. Count on me, Davy. Number rig. Yes, Colonel. Johnson, Dickinson, all of it. The garrison's too hard to defend, so Travis wants some men to start moving guns and supplies over to the Alamo Mission. There's a little church there. That'll be our headquarters. Come on, boys. The rest of that day was quiet. And that night. But the next morning... and I climbed up onto the roof of the Alamo and stared across the plain. A great cloud of dust was moving toward us. Look at it, Crockett. There must be thousands of cavalry to kick up that much dust. We're going to need reinforcements, Colonel. Yeah. 
General Fannin's army is camped over by Goliad. I'll send him word at once. By afternoon, we've mounted 14 small cannon on the mission walls. Then the enemy sent a rider up to our gates with a message for Colonel Travis. We all gathered around while he read it. They're asking for our surrender, boys. What answer shall I give them? Think it over, men. Those of you who believe in freedom, those of you who believe in what America has always stood for, will stay and fight. The rest will step forward and be counted off. As I said that, I looked straight at Thimble Ring. He just grinned back at me. <laughs> there was a difference after all. Not a man stepped forward. All right, boys. We'll give my answer. Man the gun! The rest of that day and night, the enemy kept a respectful distance. And the next day, we received reinforcements. 38 volunteers from the post at Gonzales. But with him came a message. General Fannin isn't coming, Crockett. He's too short on men and ammunition. And then, another night, and another day. Davy, look down by the river. A whole new Mexican army. We're being honored. It's General Santa Ana himself. Now, there were 4,000 of them. They set up the artillery at almost point-blank range. Outside the mission walls, the streets were filled with cavalry. Senora Candelaria watched them through a loophole. You hear that trumpet call, senores? What about it? It is the signal which means no quarter, death to all. for 10 days and nights, John. Tonight, there's no fighting. There's no sound. All is quiet. We know what that means. Out there in the darkness, they're building ladders. When it's dawn, they'll come over the walls. We'll be waiting for them here in the Church of the Alamo. If, if you get this letter, John, and I hope somehow you will, perhaps it'll help you to know me a little better. The best advice that a father can give to his son, or to any man, is this. Never turn away from a fight. Do what you must, because you must. Be sure that you're right, and then go ahead. That's all that America asks of you, or of us. Your father, David Crockett. Abram. Abram. Yeah, Davy. Better blow out your candle. It's dawn. On the morning of March 6th, 1836, the 187 defenders of the Alamo fell to the last man and woman. Through their sacrifice, all Texas was united to the battle cry of Remember the Alamo. And a few months later, the armies of Sam Houston defeated General Santa Ana and brought final freedom to the Republic of Texas, soon to be a proud and mighty member of the United States.
Carey and Lionel Barrymore will return in a moment. Have you ever looked over a child's New Year's resolution list? Well, today I saw my young nephews, and I must confess it was as ambitious in its way as any I've ever made out. For instance, he started with, uh, be a better speller. For him, that means plenty of hard work. And then there were things like, uh, scrub the bathtub when you finish, and, uh, share toys with Anne, that's his little sister. And last but not least, be a better friend. You know, it's so easy to be a better friend if you make it easy for yourself. One of the simplest ways, as I mentioned earlier, is to carry your Hallmark date book with you wherever you go. In the front of the Hallmark date book, there are special pages for the names and addresses you like to keep with you. And then there's a list of birthstones and flowers for each month, and the type of wedding present for each anniversary, so that your remembrance can be an especially appropriate one. Yes, you'll find dozens of uses for your Hallmark date book in the new year. And remember, it's yours without cost. A gift from the store where Hallmark cards are sold. Here again is Lionel Barrymore. Thank you for coming to Hallmark Playhouse tonight, Mac. You gave us a memorable picture of a great American. Thank you, Mr. Barrymore. I'm glad to hear you say that because I, I think sometimes we all tend to overlook the men and traditions that have made our country great. That's why I was interested last Sunday when you told about the Eisenhower Foundation now being started in Abilene, Kansas. Oh. It's something that's tangible evidence that Americans of this generation want to do something to see that American principles and ideals are understood and explained, not only in history books for the school kids, but throughout the world, everybody. The Eisenhower Foundation in Abilene, while it will contain General's complete uh, collection of military trophies and decorations and mementos, it will actually be dedicated to all the gallant men and women who fought for democracy and freedom in World War II. But most important, it'll be devoted to the teaching of Americanism throughout the world. Well, how can the average person who's certainly interested in this cause get behind it? By sending contributions to the Eisenhower Foundation, Abilene, Kansas. Mm -hmm. At first, General Eisenhower asked that there be no public solicitation of funds. But so many people have asked to take part that now, if you'd like, Mac, you can write a check to the Eisenhower Foundation. After all, Americanism is everyone's business, at least all Americans. <laughs> so, all you folks listening, if you'd like to participate in this memorial, just mail your check to the Eisenhower Foundation, Abilene, Kansas. Eisenhower Foundation, Abilene, Kansas. Uh, I'll remember that. Good night, Mr. Barrymore. Good night, Mac. Good night. Good night. And we hope you'll be listening to the next Sunday night. Our story will be January Thaw by Bellamy Partridge and William Root. And our guest star will be Irene Dunn. Our producer director is William Gay. Our music was composed and conducted by David Rose. And our script tonight was written by Leonard Sinclair. Until next Sunday, then, this is Lionel Barrymore saying good night. Look for Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember a Hallmark card when you carry enough to send the very best. McDonald Carey may soon be seen in The Dark of Night. The role of Polly was played by Barbara uh, Eiler, with Polly Bear as Abram, Gerald Moore as Thimble Rig, Betty Lou Gerson as Senora Candelaria, Ted DeCorsia as Sam Houston, and Tom Tolley as Colonel Travis. Every Sunday, Hallmark Cards presents two great programs for the whole family's enjoyment. On radio, the Hallmark Playhouse with host Lionel Barrymore. And on television, Sarah Churchill brings you outstanding dramatic entertainment on Hallmark Hall of Fame. Consult your paper for time and station. This is Frank Goss saying goodnight to you all until next week at the same time when Hallmark Playhouse returns to present Irene Dunn in Bellamy Partridge's and William Russo's January Thaw, and the week after that, Mary Bard's 40 Odd, starring Ruth Hussey, and the week following that, Big Family on the Hallmark Playhouse. This is the CBS Radio Network. This is KMBC, Kansas City, Missouri. <laughs>